Ladies and gentlemen, the Special Investigative Commission was established by the Icelandic Parliament, Althingi, in December 2008 to investigate and analyze the events that led to the collapse of the three principal banks in Iceland. The Commission was to present its finding in a report to Althingi. Today, the report was presented to the Speaker of Althingi, and access to the report has been opened for in the general public on the website of Althingi, which also contains English version of parts of the report. The Commission is chaired by a Supreme Court Justice, and its other two members are Iceland Parliamentary Ombudsman and a lecturer and associate chair at Yale University. In its work, the Commission was assisted by up to 50 part and full time experts. The Commission's investigation has thus first and foremost focused on the activities of the large Icelandic banks, namely Gleitner Bank, Landsbank Islands and Kaupthing Bank prior to the collapse in October 2008. A focus was also placed on a comparison with individual factors with other Icelandic financial institutions that collapsed at the beginning of 2009. The Commission furthermore investigated the arrangement of the national authority supervision and monitoring of the banks and measures for responding in a possible financial crisis prior to the collapse. Over 300 persons provided the Commission with information and 147 persons at formal hearings by the Commission. The printed version of the report by the Commission has just over 2,300 pages. Hence, it is impossible for us to address all our conclusions at such a short meeting as this one. The report's version on the website is more than 1,000 pages larger. The report is an information and data publication containing information and facts where the Commission attempts to provide an overall illustration of what happened prior to the collapse of the banks in 2008. The Commission was not intended to conduct a criminal investigation. Instead, it was to notify the Director of Public Prosecutions if suspicion arose of culpable conduct. It is then up to the Director of Public Prosecutions to determine what steps should be taken. During the debate in the Althingi on the parliamentary bill on the establishment of the Special Investigative Commission, several members of Parliament emphasised that the investigation marked, to a certain extent, the beginning of reform that needs to take place in Iceland in the wake of the collapse of the Icelandic banks and that this was definitely not to be construed as the end of the matter. Ladies and gentlemen, I now give the floor to Commission member Dr. Sigurður Benedictsdóttir, who will discuss the main causes of the collapse of the banks in 2008. I just wanted to start by pointing out that there are some chapters of the report that have already been translated into English, such as the executive summary, a uh, chapter on uh, foreign deposits at branches, Icelandic branches, and also the summary chapter that is 150 page long and pretty uh, detailed. Um, Otherwise, I just want to start by talking about the main uh, reasons for the collapse of the banks. Uh, the main cause of the failure of the banks was the rapid growth of the banks and their size at the time of the collapse. The big three banks grew 20-fold in size in seven years. Such growth is commonly associated with poor underwriting standards and poor record keeping, which can lead to solvency-related difficulties within a few years. The quality of the Icelandic bank's loan portfolios eroded under these circumstances. Its rapid growth was not compatible with long-term interest of, the, of a strong bank. Within the banks, there were also very strong incentives for growth and also from the owners of the banks. As you can see, the loan book grew the most, both in loans to holding companies and to foreign entities. 
I will, however, want to point out that foreign entities does not mean foreigners, as it can be a firm abroad that is owned by an Icelander, which was very common. The opening of the global debt financing markets to Iceland drove the growth of the banks. The Icelandic bank received high credit ratings, which was mostly inherited from Iceland's sovereign debt ratings. During 2005, the three banks issued around 14 billion euros in foreign debt securities, mostly on the European medium note term market. This was a little over the GDP of Iceland of that year. That would be equal to U.S. fetching $14 trillion in debt markets. Most of the funding matured in three to five years. Refinancing risk, therefore, was imminent. In early 2006, this became apparent, and global financial markets closed their doors for a short period. Funding dried up. But later that year, funding opened up, especially in the U.S., where the Icelandic banks had very high credit rating in comparison to the interest rate they were paying. Hence, they were prime for putting into CDOs. Early in 2000, once the liquidity crisis started in 2007, foreign deposits and short-term securities funding became the main source of funding for the three, for the three banks. And when I say short-term security funding, that is actually kind of repurchasing agreements. The only difference was that the ownership of the securities did not transfer from the banks to the lender. This short-term funding was very sensitive to any kind of market conditions and credit ratings. At the time of the collapse, repayment schedules of the outstanding of the banks was steep. In the first six months after the takeover of Glitney, almost 4 billion euros were on maturity by the three big banks. And in comparison, our currency, uh, the currency held by the central bank was 2.5 billion euros, much lower than that. The repayment schedule of collateralized loans was also steep, as more than 9 billion euros were outstanding at the collapse. And like you know, for these repurchasing agreements, maturity is within a week, two weeks, up to six months. Why was the growth of the banks this troublesome? It affected the credibility of the system. Other countries with relatively large financial systems managed to avoid disastrous banking outcomes, since unlike Iceland, those nations have long experienced and prudent ability and proven ability to supervise large international banks. Their accumulated reputation for careful prudential supervision therefore offsets their inability to provide fully reliable lender of last resort protection, at least to some extent. FME, was, which is the Financial Supervision Authority, was in general understaffed and lacked experience. FME also did not enforce legal provisions which were at their disposal despite seeing laws breaking. The Central Bank of Iceland had a currency reserve which was pretty low, at least if you look at the sizing of the financial system. And also in, co in comparison to the economy's short-term liabilities. And with short-term liabilities, I'm talking to about anything that's up due within 12 months. Debt due within 12 months in foreign currency in Iceland was 16-fold the currency reserve. Hence, pretty apparent if the krona would depreciate, we would be in very deep trouble. Foreign currency deposits grew to be eight-fold the central bank's foreign currency reserve. This increased the risk of a run on the banks. On top of this, which also came apparent in foreign press, our de deposit insurance fund was underfunded, thus decreasing the credibility of the system even further. This all led to the fact that the likelihood of a run, both on deposits and other means of funding, were, was high. And in effect, a full force run began in March 2008, 
where over a period of six weeks, approximately one billion pounds were withdrawn from UK branches of ISAF. But we were able to prevail at that point. We find that the owners of all three banks had abnormally easy access to loans in these banks and apparently in the, their capacity as owners. The largest exposure of all three banks, Glitner, Kaupthingbanki and Landsbanki, were the bank's principal owners. This raises the question as to whether the lending was done at arm's length. The operations of the bank were in many ways characterized by their maximizing the benefit of the majority shareholders who held the reins within the banks rather than by running reliable banks with, in, with interest of all shareholders. And to show due responsibility towards creditors. In late 2007 and 2008, the banks began to experience funding problems like many other international banks. It seems that at that point, the boundaries between the interests of the banks and the interests of the shareholders, the majority shareholders, were often blurry, and that the banks put more emphasis on backing of their owners than can be considered acceptable. Examination of the investments made by the money market funds also, which were operated and managed by companies of the three banks, which are supposed to be independent, also reveal that the prime investments of these companies were securities that came from the owners of the banks. And deposits, if there were any, were at the bank that owned the company. We find that this investment decision cannot have been determined by coincidence alone. I decided to put some uh, graphs up also here for the foreign press. And here you can see Bauer Group, which was a large uh, com holding company here in Iceland. And they actually got uh, ownership stake into Glitnir Bankin. And here you can see how their borrowing evolved with Glitnir Bankin. And it is of no surprise when you're looking at that figure that actually the ownership of the bank changed and the governance of the bank changed mid-year 2007. Fon Exista, on the other hand, was a big stakeholder in Kaupthing on 23% of Kaupthing. And the lending to Exista was extensive. Also a lending with, with, that was secured with stocks of Exista. Björgulu Thor Björgulsson, who was a big owner of the Landsbanki, also had easy access to money at Landsbanki. This amounted to almost 30% of the bank's equity base. One of our main findings is that the equity of the banks, which, as I was explaining actually earlier on the, in the Icelandic press conference, was often uh, stated as being strong equity ratios was actually quite weak. The bank risk exposure due to funding of own shares was excessive. Direct loans with collateral in own shares. Forward contracts on their own shares, which amount to just lending for own shares. The bank's capital ratios therefore did not reflect the real ability of the banks nor the financial system as a whole withstand losses. The three banks themselves had financed a total of 300 billion Icelandic krona of their own share in mid-2008. We call this in the report weak equity. At the same time, the capital base of the banks was about 1,200 billion Icelandic krona. And hence, the weak equity repre represented more than 25% of the bank's capital base in mid-year 2008. Within the bank capital base also are uh, loans, uh, subordinated loans, 33%. If cross-financing is figured in, that is, lending from one bank for the shares of another bank here within Iceland, this amounted to 400 billion Icelandic kronas, or nearly 70% of core capital. And core capital is the capital base when I deduct 
uh, long-term subordinate loans. The Special Investi Investigation Commission is of the opinion that the financing of own equity in the Icelandic banking system had in such large proportion been based on borrowing from the system itself that its stability was threatened. An overestimation of the equity in a, in a bank increases its cap cap capacity to grow. The bank's capacity to deal with setbacks decreases at the same time. This increases the probability of a bankruptcy. The loss to depositors and other creditors will be greater than it would otherwise have been in a bankruptcy under these circumstances. If the bank in question is systematically important, as was the case with all the banks in Iceland, the cost to society will be significant, as history has shown. The Special Investigation Commission concludes that loans exclusively secured with collaterals in the institution's own shares should be subtracted from equity of the institution. The same should apply to shares formally registered as owned by third party and for own account of the representative financial institution. Foreign deposits grew a lot. Foreign deposits in Icelandic banks increased considerably from the end of 2006 when they were launched in October. It was in, uh, in Arte Alia, the bank's response to the criticism at the beginning of that year of the one-sided financing of the banks through their foreign debt security markets. The foreign deposit of the three banks had become eight times larger than the central bank's monetary reserve at the end of 2007. This, of course, affected the credibility of the financial system. From the end of the third quarter of 2006 until mid-year 2007, deposits in Landsbanki foreign branches in London and in the Netherlands increased by 9 billion euros, three quarters of our GDP almost. The largest proportion of this growth was at the Landsbanki branch in UK, as you can see from the green, green things there. Lending growth Lending growth was considerable in Landsbanki during this period, this nine-month period, or 5 billion euros. This included mostly, or the increase was the greatest, in lending to holding companies and foreign parties. At the time also, net borrowing decreased in bond markets. So this was also replacing bond market financing. The decrease was approximately 1.5 billion euros. Towards the end, the last 12 months, it can be said that the outflow of wholesale deposits in the UK and Dutch branches actually outnumbered the increase in deposits at the same time, in retail deposits. One of the things that increased the risk and the cost of this collapse to Iceland was what we call debt repatri repatriation. The largest Icelandic investment companies had, in addition to borrowing in Iceland, been doing business with foreign banks and borrowed from them as well. Several of these loans were secured by pledging the Icelandic bank's securities. As, a, as share prices fell, the quality of the collateral for the Icelandic companies declined. The foreign conducted margin calls repeatedly or they closed credit lines completely. The reply of the three banks here was to take over the financing so the loans to the foreign banks could be paid up. Thus, the Icelandic banks loaned out high amounts. At the same time, they were suffering from a considerable shortage of liquid assets. Our question is why? The performance of the banks was too tied up to the performance of these firms. So the only way out was to lend to them or fall with them. So they're bad. They're bad for life. Also, and not, this is not put down in the ranking of what we think is the most probable 
but this is also an issue. These investment companies had an abnormal easy access to loans in the banks in the capacity of their ownership and influences within them. These loans were largely made in order to finance the purchase of the shares in the banks themselves. To prevent sales of the shares, the banks overtook the financing in an effort to maintain the value of the shares. And this conclusion is in a connection to us looking at the market here for stock, stock market here, which seems to have been manipulated in the last 12 months greatly. Also, the failure of a small investment firm in January, Gnumper, had actually created a stir in international financial markets and prevented Glitner from receiving financing in that month in the roadshow. So some of the reason was also just to prevent negative publicity that always reflected in their own credit ratings. Risks were increasing, and in light of the prevailing market conditions from the autumn from 2007, it was difficult for the banks to unwind the risks that had formed within the system. A large part of the problem that the banks tried to react to in the prelude to their collapse was due to risks that were already in place within the system when the liquidity crisis hit. The banks had taken risks with their operations when the going was better. And it should therefore be pointed out that risks, form, that risks are formed when they're taken and not when stock prices and exchange rates start to fall. Increased loans to owners, the taking over of fi foreign financing, lo losses due to buying and selling of own stocks, and other comparable behavior of the banks, to the extent that is described in the report, can, however, hardly be considered legitimate reaction to such problems or in bearing with a healthy and normal business practices. When the banks collapsed, there was an, an inevitable and significant reduction in the value of their assets. That's just nature of banking. When they collapse, their assets burn up. It is, however, the Commission's finding that the quality of the loan portfolios has started to erode at least 12 months before the collapse and continued to erode until the collapse, even though this was not reported in the bank's financial statements. The investigation by, by the Commission into the financing of the banks strongly suggests that the worth of the loans and related liabilities was exaggerated in the bank's financial statements for the year end 2007 and the semi-annual statement for 2008. The values of the assets of the three big banks were adjusted in November 2008. Before they were 12,000 billion Icelandic kroner. After the adjustment, they were 4,500 billion Icelandic kroner. A write down of 7,000 billion, or about 60% of their assets. The write down at the end of June 2008 was a total of 67 billion kroners, or 0.7% of the company's total assets at that time. Just for comparison, the GDP of Iceland in 2008 was approximately 1,400 billion, meaning that the write-down of the assets of the financial co companies corresponded to five years of, the, of Iceland's GDP. Uh, as you will be able to read about in Chapter 21 of the report, which has been translated, the Commission has concluded that in its work it has come across issues that can be considered mistakes or negligence according to the first paragraph of the Act of the Commission relating to the work of three ministers at that time, the Prime Minister, Finance Minister and the Minister of Commerce. Also relating to the work of three governors of the central bank at that time, and also in relation to the work of the manager of the financing, financial supervision, supervisory authority at that time. And that is our final conclusion.
will not be taking any questions in this session. So this is the end of our first meeting. Thank you very much.